So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. Hey everyone, this is Lair Torrent. I am a I am a licensed therapist, author of the book The Practice of Love, and the holistic therapist on Instagram. I am here with my lovely bride and my partner of twenty one happy years, Miss Ashley Torrent. We are taking over the Angry Therapist podcast today, his single on purpose podcast. And uh, Ash, why don't you introduce yourself real quick and tell him what you do? Psycho spiritual therapist and an intuitive medium, and I also teach classes in spiritual mediumship. That's right. And uh, so today we've decided to talk about something that is uh, something we've dealt with in our relationship over the course of the last twenty-one years. We wanted to make sure it was sort of organic and pertain to us, that we can speak to it from a clinical perspective, but also from a personal perspective, because. The clinical, clinical perspective on any one thing can be great, but it can also um, not necessarily land uh, for folks who are dealing with it personally. So we wanted to do something that spoke that we could speak to both personally and professionally, and that is trauma in your relationship, meaning deep-seated, acute, systemic trauma that comes from perhaps childhood, that comes from even a, a former relationship that was, again, acute, that there was... Um, and quite impactful, um, something that, that that one or both partners can it brings forward and it plays out within the new relationship. And that's certainly true for us. Is that right, Ash? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> can you speak a little <laughs> bit more about that? What are your thoughts on what I just said? Well, um, yeah, we. I think it's an important topic because um, trauma plays out in all areas of our life. And if we're not aware of how it can impact our relationships, then it shows up. It's pretty insidious. Um, I don't think either of us were prepared for how my trauma would show up in our relationship because I was so dissociated. I didn't really know how traumatized I was. Um, but this is an important topic because even if you're, if you're single and you're working on yourselves, and if you're thinking about getting into a relationship at some point, um, we're going to talk about things to look for if you are engaging with a partner that has trauma or if you have trauma yourself that I'm hoping will be helpful. Great. And I think it's a perspective yeah. that we don't hear much about. It's a hopeful perspective. Certainly. And I know that when I, I did a, a reel on it on my Instagram channel and um, it was one of the more popular ones, uh, people really, that, that people really uh, commented on it. Thank me for speaking to it this idea that trauma shows up in what might seem like a perfectly good relationship. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're dealing with this thing. And we're going to get into what that thing is. But first I want to make a couple of qualifiers. And that is that um, we may use terms like traumatized partner today. And we may use terms like non-traumatized partner. We by no means actually mean that, right? Am I right, Ash? We don't, we don't actually mean yeah. that we're concretized in those ideas that there is a non-traumatized part. I think, I think most of us in this world have some level of trauma, um, right. but for time's sake and for the time we have here on the angry therapist podcast, we may use those terms. Understand we don't mean them in totality. Um, I also want to talk about trauma in our core conflicts. I think we all bring our shit forward. Right. It's what Harville Hendricks said. He said, we are inexplicably drawn to the arms of a romantic partner who will be who will, by their very nature, recapitulate our childhood trauma. But for a very good reason, so that we might find healing. And I think that's right. And I say in my book that um, we bring that trauma forward in the form of am I loved? Am I safe? Am I enough? And do I matter? These for me are 
our four core conflicts uh, that we have with us, that we bring with us as human beings. I'll say that again. Am I loved? Am I safe? Am I enough? And do I matter? We are asking these questions um, from often from a very young place. Now, I say that most of us, we all bring some level of that to the table and our to our relational table. I think that's right. And that's what I see in my practice. And that's what I've seen primarily in my life. Now, a quote unquote sort of low level kind of non-traumatized uh, boilerplate person comes to the table in, a, in, a, in your relationship. And maybe you have one of these. Maybe you have one that dovetails a little bit into two. But if you're a traumatized person, if you've acu- if you've if you've experienced um, childhood trauma, systemic trauma, um, trauma that's lasted over the course of time, maybe in, a, in, a, in an abusive relationship, you're probably going to get not just one, not one that dovetails into two. You're going to get two, three, and maybe even four of these. And that might look like, I don't know, if a parent was dangerous, if a parent was abusive, you are going to question from a very young place, from a very deep-seated place within you, well, since the people who are supposed to be safe in the world weren't, I'm not safe, therefore I'm not loved, and they did that to me, so I'm not enough, and nor do I matter. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that, Ash? I agree. I mean, all those questions, um, especially for someone who had the kind of trauma I'd had, which started in the womb and continued um, until I actually left the relationship with my family at 26. um, I didn't have any of those questions answered in the affirmative. Um, So I was really operating in a deficit until you came along (laughs) and you began answering them. (laughs) Well, I I began trying to help you answer them. Can you, I I was wondering at this point, you touched into it a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more about the, because we're sort of highlighting your trauma as it showed up in our relationship. That's not to say that I don't have my own. It's just because hers was as acute as it was and kind of showed up first. We've been forced to kind of deal with it first as a couple, uh, you as an individual and us as a couple. Um, I'm not, that's not to say that I don't have it because I do. And we're finding that out now, which is lovely. Um, so much. Can you talk a little, it's so good. I love it so much. Um, but can you, can you talk about, can you talk about your trauma and um, where it came from and kind of um, wh- how it's been playing out? Yeah. And, and I did want to go back to when you talked about traumatized partner versus non-traumatized partner, and you were saying those aren't concretized identities. And that's so true because what you're going to find in a friendship and a relationship and um, that you sometimes trade off in your healing process. And that's part of it. Sometimes one person's healing is at the forefront and then they're in a higher point or a more resilient place in their life and the other person's rises. So, um, yes. So so today, just for these purposes, we're going to be talking about your experience and my experience of my trauma in the early and in a lot of our relationship. Um, so Mm -hmm. I was born to a mother who has borderline personality disorder and, I want to just say that we use these labels because sometimes they are important. I'm careful with labels. I'm careful with diagnosis. Um, but for these purposes, I think it's important to understand that borderline personality disorder, um, it's on a spectrum and there's a, um, there's an end with some people displaying tendencies and then there's an end that's more towards psychosis. And so I was born to a woman who Mm -hmm. has the tendency towards psychosis. Um, Mm -hmm. and this, increased over time um, in our relationship and as I got older. And I think as she got older, it got worse. Um, And so someone with borderline personality disorder can experience violent mood swings, volatility. Um, Basically how I like to describe it is what it feels like to me is that um, from the outside looking at someone like this, like my mother, is that they are an exposed nerve. Um, Mm. And that nerve that is like an open wound that is coming in contact with the world and the world is constantly rubbing up against that nerve in the wrong way. And it's creating these um, reactions and feelings and volatility and sadness and anger and fear within the person who has it. Now, a lot of this comes from an abandonment wound early on. Um, Mm -hmm. Some people might describe someone like my mother who is stunted at maybe five years old. So moving through the world with a five-year-old abandonment wound with a five-year-old emotional intelligence. I'm not saying everyone who has this is like this. This is Mm -hmm. my experience of my relationship with this person. Um, Mm -hmm. And so what often happens is if the person's not able to heal, they create their own reality to protect themselves. So um, everything 
that as may actually be happening between two people, they can say, like, if, if I said the sky is blue, she would say it was pink and then push and push and push until I believe the sky was pink. It comes with a lot of brainwashing, especially if this is a, a lot parent. of gaslighting. It comes with a lot of control, gaslighting, physical, mm-hmm. emotional, psychological abuse, um, sexualization of your child. Um, and a lot of addiction is often seen in this kind of relationship. So um, I, you know, this started in the womb. Um, it started the minute I came into the world. I'm um, just from the work I've done. Uh, I can, my body has, you know, really sent me messages about this, but I was physically, emotionally, and psychologically abused. I was brainwashed for the time I was in relationship to her. Um, I wasn't allowed to, um, I wasn't allowed to display feelings or opinions or preferences. If I was happy, she would do whatever she could to put that out, to shame me. I wasn't allowed to speak freely. I could get slapped, Mm -hmm. I could get choked. We would get in fights over things I wore. Um, Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, just kind of give you an example of the brainwashing. I remember coming down one stairs in high school and I was wearing like a denim skirt and a t-shirt and flats. And because I wasn't wearing pantyhose, I I was a whore. I looked like a whore. And then the next day I put on jeans and a t-shirt and I looked like white trash. You know, so it's like this constant, you can't get it right. And um, so uh, eventually over time, you just become invisible and silent and dissociated, completely disembodied because being in your body is not safe. And so can you talk about how that sort of experience, um, and I know that that's just a thumbnail of what, what it is you experienced. How did that come forward in your relationship with me? Once you, I mean, you knew at some point that we were going to be long-term and that you were in it. And so when did that finally start showing itself and how? Well, what's so interesting is I was even in a, um, I was in therapy when we met and um, I was with the therapist who was rewounding me and I didn't know it until you pointed it out in a session, which was really eye-opening. But I remember we had a con- one of our very first conversations in the basement of Brother Jimmy's. You were counting out that your money. A, I was this manager. That was a, was a yeah, You've qualified that. We were, we were bar- I was a bartender and she was re waitressing singer. We I was manager, managing we were. you. That was that's right. Oh, that's so right. You were counting out your money from the night. And um, I just remember we were having a conversation and I can't even remember what it was specifically. I think you were asking me about where I was from and things. But the way you listened and the way you spoke to me, it, mm-hmm. my, I, could, I remember having such a visceral experience in my body as if you saw me. Like you mm-hmm. wanted to know me and you saw mm-hmm. something so much more. I mean, I've talked about the first time you looked at me when we met and it was like, you saw through to the core of me and it made me so mm-hmm. uncomfortable because I didn't really know what was there. And it was like, your eyes reflected back the truth of me, but I didn't even know what the truth of me was. So it was terrifying. Um, okay. But, but my point being is you were really the first to see me. And in the process of you seeing me and getting to know me and taking an interest in me and then and loving me and being an advocate for me, I came to life. And I don't mean to sound dramatic, but you made what was invisible visible. You allowed mm-hmm. me to come into this world and be seen and become more embodied just because you welcomed me. You welcomed who I was. Um, mm-hmm. And that was such a visceral new experience for me. Now, did that so that's you not really how, what'd you say? Yeah. I was going to say, is that, how, does that touch it? Does that help you touch into the work you need to do? Did that help did that push the button of your trauma? Because it, it seemed to me in my experience, and I think that people who are having a relationship where they're going along in the beginning of a relationship, then all of a sudden, perhaps you become aware as I did, uh, that this, this person has again, deep seated acute trauma. Um, it really hadn't manifested itself or presented in any particular way. And it, I think it could, could, surprised people that I remember, I think, oh, wow. I remember you talking about it and thinking, well, she seems okay. I mean, she seems <laughs> like she's handling it. Yeah, right. And then there. it was, but then when we started doing our personal work, you started really digging in. We went to school and that forced us to dig in to mm-hmm. ourselves. It feels like that was the slippery slope that when you started to really dig in and, and, and name it. And um, I keep saying doing your personal work that that's when we started really seeing the prevalence of your, the depths of your sadness, the depths of your trauma, the depths of the the abuse that you experienced. Oh yeah. I mean, I think what I realized now is I couldn't, I couldn't go away anymore. I couldn't become invisible. And you and I lived together pretty quickly. Not pretty quickly, you know, um, but you, we, when we lived together, I couldn't hide. 
and you mm -hmm. can't hide, you can't disassociate someone is there with you, um, present mm -hmm. with you. And all of a sudden what you've been moving away from your whole life, the pain or your own existence, all of a sudden you're existing in this body and you're interacting with this person who sees you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know, I didn't know who I was. I didn't really know how to be. I mean, I knew, I knew that I loved you. I knew how to love you. I knew what I was moving towards, but, um, again, when you're so dissociated, like I, I used to wake up every morning and feel shame. I don't think I felt that shame until I began mm -hmm. landing in my body. And I remember in Helix, we did the core conflicts and that was um, school we went to. That, that school we went to, sorry, the psycho spiritual school we went to, we did, we did exercises around core conflicts and mine was the first and it was around the hated child. And I remember mm -hmm. after that class, when I realized I was the hated child, that first chakra wounding of the belief that I didn't have the right to be here, fear being the demon of that first chakra, you know, just, mm -hmm. um, I ran out of that room mm -hmm. and I was, I was blown away. And that was the day I landed fully and I, I could never disappear again. And then I felt so awkward going forward. I felt so exposed. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like, I couldn't go away anymore. And there I was. And then it began playing out. I think, and um, different arguments we had. And yeah, let's talk about that. Let's, we had, we begin. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> let's, no, let's talk about how it presents in within the relationship, like b between two people, at least how it presented between us. Right. Yeah. Maybe you should you start know, with that because you probably saw well, it first. Well, <laughs> um, you know, so I, m I met this sweet, lovely, soft-spoken, the person that everyone's seeing right now and, and the people who meet you, they kind of go, huh? Um, and, <laughs> and then I got to meet your protector side oh, yeah. and, you know, we talked a lot in the book about parts and protector parts and the fact that I said that, um, that, that, that a part of us grows finally to learn that, that, that learns sort of in the jungle of your upbringing, it grows and is forged in the fires of your trauma. And as I remember that quote from the book, I think to myself, that is, that's really true. Um, that's really true for you because there was this part of you that I met. And we can also talk about the fact that I feel like you've some level felt safe enough to show me that. Um, but I met a protector part of you that was like, man, like she was not to be trifled with little, little TNT. Well, we used to call you. Yeah. Little TNT. Well, <laughs> If you think about it, I could not have a fight response. The times I fought back with my mother were really dangerous. So um, I yeah. suppressed that fight response. And I really believed that I knew on some level, my body knew that I was safe enough to fight back with you, but obviously mm -hmm. not in the level, but that pent up rage that would come out. Um, if you, you know, said something that was triggering, which everything at that time was triggering, you know, I had so much fear of, was I lovable? Was I safe? You know, would I be left? Um, I would go into a blackout rage. Like I wouldn't even know what was happening. Um, you would have to repeat things that I'd said. So I would be aware of it. And I would also, I remember playing out dynamics with you. Um, the fights with my mother were so volatile um, that I remember sometimes you and I going back and forth and our voices getting raised and I would just dissociate completely, but I would be in that blackout rage. And sometimes you would say, you would say, I don't even recognize the look in your eye right now. Like you're not here. You're fighting with someone else is basically what you were saying. Um, right. And what was so beautiful about you and I so appreciate it is that you were really great to call me out um, in a gentle manner after they were over, but to also set boundaries. Like we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This, this can't live between us like that. And I think it's important to note that when we're talking about these wounded children, the, the traumatized wounded children, the parts that grow, hopefully to I mean, say, hopefully to protect us because you needed to protect yourself in that jungle. Um, when they come to play in the relationship, well, you know, love is inherently dangerous and um, love will, uh, I'll say your, your, your romantic partner can seem like the most dangerous person in the entire world because you, you're supposed to be so vulnerable to them. And mm -hmm. I felt like there was sort of an acute response to the, that vulnerability, um, yes. coupled with, you know, if I happen to push on, um, any of those sore spots. And I, and I think I could say with some confidence to anyone out there who is like, wow, I think I am in a relationship with someone who is desperately traumatized by whatever. 
um, that you're going to, you're going to run into those. You're going to bump into this. Like you said, you're going to, they wear their, 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 um, nerves on the outside of their skin. I think to some degree, when you're traumatized that way, you do that, you do that as well. And you are destined as a love yeah. relationship partner to bump into those wounds as well. And you probably need to have some countermeasures, countermeasures that I wouldn't have had, had it not been for Helix and us going to school and doing our personal work together. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. And so I know for me, um, mindfulness training was really, really important being able to take that breath and titrate my nervous system down. And, but, but, you know, prior to that, to your point, I think, um, I did meet you in that place cause I'm a fighter. I'm, I am definitely, uh, a fiery fighter and, uh, would draw hard boundaries and push back. And so that did, I think, and then we add to the fact that we were two bartenders in New York, you know, and we were drinking probably way too much at the time. Not probably we were, no. um, <laughs> that did not, that didn't help things. And so that left us in this place of, holy shit is, and I remember thinking like, is this really going to work? Um, how are we going to make this yeah. work? Because yeah. Yeah. When I met that side of you it was, it was, it was intense. Well, the thing that I look back and I respect so much is that you always required more from me and expected more from me. Um, not in a, if you don't get it together, I'm leaving kind of way, but in, I believe in you kind of way. And one of the things that I think someone could have come along, the wrong person could have come along and seen this wounded bird and wanted to be seen this wounded bird and wanted to be their hero and sw swept in mm -hmm. and tried to save me. And mm -hmm. you didn't do that. You came in and from the beginning, you saw something in me. It was, it was like, you saw the potential in me, um, whether you mm -hmm. were conscious of it or not, you had expectations of me that I could do better, that I could heal. Um, mm -hmm. you required more from me. You set boundaries, um, in a loving manner. And you taught me to be an advocate for myself. You were always the one that asked me to fight, to fight harder for myself. Um, mm -hmm. and then you also, I remember one day said, when do I stop paying for what those assholes did to you? You know, it was like, when do I see the constancy of you? And I remember you saying that and thinking, right, how long is this going to take? And that question really sat in me. And I've worked with couples um, and people who've been in trauma and they say, you know, mindfulness is too hard. I can't stop my reactions. But I just remember thinking, I, can, I have to do better because I love this person. I have to do better, not only for me, because he's showing me something that's so powerful and so helpful for me. And he's showing me constancy and mirroring like my goodness and loving me in this way. But I have to do it for myself and for him. And there's no choice, you know, not to be mindful at that point. That's right. Um, I want to talk. We talked about sort of the volatility and the anger that can show up between partners mm -hmm. when these mm -hmm. protective aspects, when we feel so vulnerable and we have experienced trauma and it's not safe uh, for us to feel that way. Um, we've never felt like we've lo we're loved. We've never felt like perhaps we mattered enough for someone to really show up. And so we're concretized in that. But let's talk also about how else it shows up, because that wasn't the only color that you showed me for sure. Like we had our knockdown drag outs for sure, where things got heated. Um, but, you know, that was not the only way that this trauma really showed up. And, and so, you know, I remember, and again, another I tell a story about it in the book where I, I came out and, you know, it wasn't just this time. I sort of, that story was almost an amalgam of many stories where I would come out and see you just in it and deep, deep sadness. And I think that's another way that it presents. And, you know, um, if you're a person, men, probably men, um, but I don't want to pay with gender, gender strokes, but probably men have a hard time uh, seeing that type of sadness and seeing that depth of emotionality. Um, I think it can be scary. I know there were moments when it was for me, um, it's hard to understand and, uh, can, let's just, let's, let's bat that one around a little bit. Yeah, that was really hard. You know, I think when I look back, what was happening is, um, like I said, I couldn't have any emotions growing up. So, 
I remember having panic attacks on trains, but not knowing I was having panic attacks till years later, I started noticing symptoms and realized I've been having this, these for all years, but that's how suppressed I had to be is a panic attack, but not even knowing I'm having a panic attack. So I was pretty emotionless um, and checked out. So when we got together and we were doing our work, it was like all the things that were there that I hadn't allowed myself to feel. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of shame, a lot of sadness, a lot of fear. The world was terrifying to me. I remember walking through the streets of New York and feeling so overwhelmed by the crowds and also afraid people would see me. This sounds so mm -hmm. weird, but hopefully it'll make sense, um, especially to anyone who has this kind of trauma. But I was afraid people would come up to me and shame me for whatever I was wearing, would shame mm -hmm. me for just existing. Like people would wow. call me ugly. I mean, this is... It's such distorted thinking, but when you live in a house with someone who's picking you apart on a regular basis, all you're used to is that there must be something wrong with you all the time. So the outs and in New York, there's all these people around these possibilities of people to say these things to you. So just existing was really hard. I would wake up, I would feel a lot of shame, a lot of darkness. I just thought it was a really bad person. Um, but it was confusing because I wasn't doing bad things. So there was this disjointed, and again, that's the brainwashing, such a disjointed reality between, um, I'm just making coffee this morning. I'm just trying to wake up and live, but feeling like I don't deserve to live. Um, and I can't even what? imagine what I think back to those times where you'd wake up and see me mm -hmm. and I couldn't even hide it. I couldn't suppress it anymore. Well, that's the famous use your tool story. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Because to fill people in, I, and I covered it in the book where, you know, I was so confused, right? You said you were confused. I too was confused because here I saw this beautiful woman who had terrible body dysmorphia. Uh, I saw this vibrant human who in the world, people would just be like, oh my God, she's so great. You know, how did you land her is kind of the prevailing um, the, the narrative that I heard from oh, people. I knew. <laughs> 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 right. And, and then, you know, sort of juxtapose that against what I was seeing often at home. And I got up one morning and I found her in our living room, sitting alone um, and just sobbing. And it wasn't the first time. And we had been in school and we, and, and Helix was the school that really asked us to dig into our own shit and read and do the work, do our own work. Don't ask a client to, to walk a path that you're not, that you won't walk yourself. Well, there she was. Excuse me, it makes me emotional to even think about it now. Um, there she was walking that path. And I said, use your tools. <laughs> you know, <laughs> where are your I tools? But I don't know what. You said, use your tools. Ash. Well, use your tools. Use your tools. Use your tools. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, uh. you know, what I didn't understand was that the trauma precluded you, the compartmentalization precluded you from using your tools. Yeah. You don't have access to any tools when you're in that part of you. Trauma is such a powerful lens. That's the lens you see the world through. And there's no room for a new narrative until you reinforce those new narratives. But at that point, there were no new narratives. And I was so heartbreaking to watch. And I was so yeah. desperate to try and help you. And and this is where I think people find themselves, right? Like you're desperately trying to help this person and you're ham-fisted at best yeah. um, as you see them suffering. And then, you know, there's, there's um, a suicidal aspect to it that, yeah. you know, um, was frightening. I don't know if you yeah. want to speak to any of that. Um, like but, I'm dark. Uh, I mean, I, um, I tried to protect you from a lot of that. Um, try not to talk too much about it, but I did think about it. And there was one day I actually to consider it. Um, and I really just couldn't imagine you coming home to that. I couldn't do that to you. Um, but the darkness that trauma can take you um, to that, you're just a worthless piece of shit. Um, right. And that, and that story is bigger than all the other things that are happening in your life, like even bigger than your partner telling you how wonderful you are or doing work in school. Um, right. That's a great I, point. I, right? I, yeah. I often thought, you know, and I still think about you holding space for me then how hard it must have been to witness someone that you could see as like such vibrant possibility, um, but not being able to see it within themselves and knowing that you 
like you said, you couldn't save me from it. I mean, in so many ways, your love for me, I believe, and I don't think this is a far mm -hmm. stretch. If you hadn't come along, I don't know that I would have made it. If you and I had oh not met because of just the type of person you were in the love, I really feel like I wouldn't have made it. And that doesn't mean that other traumatized people won't find their way, but because of who I was at the time and what I was going through, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. just your constancy and your love for me and your fighting for me and just making me reminding me that I am good and all that, it, it brought me to life. Um, and I know I did my own work. I fought for myself. I was in therapy all the time. I'm still in therapy. Um, I would get up every day. I would journal. I would exercise. I would do all the things to keep my head on straight. Um, but your consistency with me was just so helpful. Well, and that, that for me was the hardest part is the quote unquote, you know, non-traumatized partner. Um, using that word, we said we would, we're going to use, um, that I, that you couldn't see what I could see, right. right. That, that you couldn't see the beauty, the vibrance, the, 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 just the lovely human being. And, and I think that's an important thing, right? Because when you're in that, in that PTSD response, in that traumatized response, you see, that's, you see the world through that lens, if I'm right. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, how trauma works is, and you know this, but like the brain, uh, operates with the, the traumatized overlay. And so when, when that happens, you're meeting everyone and everything, including yourself through that traumatic overlay. And so that becomes the yeah. filter. And so now I understand it, that that filter had to somehow, and that the filter wasn't always there. Sometimes it was there and often, sometimes it wasn't. And that became even, that became uh, confusing. And so one of the things I would say to people out there is yeah, it will feel inconsistent. And there will be times when you're like, yeah, we're by that. That's a thing of the past. And then <laughs> something will happen. Right. Right. And I remember that. I remember being like, oh shit. And so this is where I say that like trauma can be so inconvenient and yeah. love, love is inconvenient anyway. And, um, uh, but to really love you, and I think people who are dealing with this in, in their lives, to really love that person is to also accept the fact that this is, in fact, something that they're dealing with. And when I'm working with clients where this is presenting itself, out of either out of the gate or it somehow pops up, um, that, that it's helpful sometimes to think of your partner not as the identified patient. We don't want to do that. We don't want them to become a bucket of symptoms for us to fix because you can't fix it. Um, but to recognize them as almost as if when we, when we deal with chronically ill folks, like if you have a couple, you said with that, one I was part, like, yeah. yeah, I felt so seen that. when you said that, cause that's what it feels. PTSD feels like a chronic illness. I don't think we need to think about chronic illness or PTSD as it will never heal or never get better, but it's something you deal with, with an ongoing basis and you can have flare ups, you know, triggers with PTSD mm -hmm. flare ups with chronic illness. And so I just want to say that when you said that, I, I just felt so incredibly seen. Yeah, because it does it mirror like chronic illness does mirror, as you said, um, uh, PTSD in the relationship. And so if you're a partner of someone who has PTSD uh, and trauma, um, it's important to look upon them that way. And so, you know, for me hearing that, I was like, oh, so, you know, that that invokes the compassionate lens that invokes that part of me that goes, OK, so I need to make space for this. I need to be. It can't define our relationship. And these are the, these are the sort of the, no. the notes we give to folks with chronic illness in the relationship. It can't define the relationship, but you can't deny it. It has to be, you have to make room for it. It has, there has to be space for it. And if you are going to be partnered with someone with PTSD or chronic illness, you have to make room in your life and in yourself for that fact, because it's a fact. And while often chronic illness this is a point I want to make chronic illness can show symptomatically as something that you can see. Maybe they're in pain. Maybe they're scarring. Maybe there's a surgery or something that goes, yeah, there that is. PTSD doesn't do that, right? And so with the folks that I work with, very often it's like if someone's telling you they're having this feeling, you should fucking believe them. Yeah. And that becomes doubly true for someone with, 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 uh, with trauma and PTSD. And yeah. So when you tell me that you're in it or you're having a day or you're, you're having some, some trigger, you've been triggered by something, you know, I'm quick now because I've been dealing with it for a while 
to make sure that I make room. And the first thing I say is, okay, what do you need? What do you well, need? And Sometimes you're like, you know, nothing. right. Nothing. Um, but I've learned, you know, I remember times when I, you were like, there's something always physically wrong with you. And there was a time where mm-hmm. my immune system was like mm-hmm. not at war, but fighting with the trauma. And I did have cycles of, um, illness, um, like a virus called Epstein-Barr that I would feel like I was getting sick every six weeks. And, you know, there were just, I remember there were just things going on in our early in our relationship where you were like, you're, you don't feel well a lot. So it was interesting Mm -hmm. to not only have the emotional aspect, but the physical aspect. And it, you know, it wasn't until maybe six years ago that I realized the toll that the trauma was taking on my body that I hadn't been able to heal. Um, but you were always really good at believing me, but you were really good at reflecting back like, do you recognize this is happening a lot? And it didn't feel like in a judgmental way. It felt like we need to look at this way. Yeah, I was concerned. I was concerned as shit. You know, I, I remember now that you say that, I kind of blocked that out that, you know, there was that point. I was like, wow. Um, and and I want to say that for the partners in my position, um, it can feel exhausting. It can feel, again, yeah. um, inconvenient you might even find yourself becoming annoyed. Um, And if you find yourself feeling that the trauma is inconvenient, that the feelings are too much um, and that you're becoming annoyed, I'm sorry, you still have to make space. That's what love would do. You still make space, but you, that's also a sign that you need to take care of yourself. And I say that knowing that I'm very often not particularly good at that. And I know that you probably commented, but you know, it's time to, um, look at the, the, your compassion meter. You may be running a little bit low and that you need to begin to take care of yourself. Yeah. It's so important when you have compassion fatigue that you say, I can't right now, you know, I'll, mm-hmm. I need some time for myself, but I'll make time later. Um, mm-hmm. I also know that in watching you over the years, you know, as I was doing my work, I've, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, Oh, I'm working out this thing, but you know, you don't have to hold space for that. I've got it. You know, my Mm -hmm. job is to be as resilient as I can. And I want to say to those people who have trauma, we can become a victim of our trauma. And if Mm -hmm. someone's, if someone is such a, is loves us and caretakes us, it could be easy to fall into them becoming a caretaking role. And I didn't want that for you. I didn't want that for myself. And you Mm -hmm. always ask more of me. So I, I want to say as much as the trauma was inconvenient, I feel like you were always making sure that, um, you set boundaries with things like we've said. Um, but I've always been fighting for myself. Like I consider therapy, like keeping, I would say to you, it's the electric bill. I'm paying the electric bill in my head. It's, there's, it's no question. And I would show up for that. Um, and it's my job also as your partner to keep an eye out for like, what am I asking of this person? And you know, can, what can I take care of myself and what actually do I need help with? Um, because it is a lot. I've seen you hold, hold a lot over the years and thankfully it is getting better and has gotten so much better, but yeah. Yeah, And let's also recognize that I've had my shit too. Right. And you've made plenty of space for that. And I think that's another really important point that for the person who is the quote unquote, non-traumatized partner, it's often very good for the traumatized identified, uh, patient person to trade roles with you. Yeah. and become the caretaker that these roles cannot become concretized it's a climbing term but one person can't always be holding the belay rope the safety rope in the climb right mm-hmm. you need to switch off from time to time and that's good for innumerable reasons not the least of which is it, it is a reminder to the traumatized person that oh that's right i do have facility i do have the ability yeah. to help someone including myself and it's really good for the relationship for the roles to reverse and for um for the person who is the the non-traumatized person to, to be able to sort of fall apart in in their arms um, and uh, experience being supported too. And I think we've done a good job of that over the years. You've done a very good job of that with me. Oh, I I, I think we have done a great job. Um, We always make space for the other person. Um, Not the sacrificing of our own well-being. No, but can you speak to to like, can you speak to, that idea that it was good to kind of like go, wait a minute, I'm, I do have facility here. I do have, uh, I, I actually need to step up and, and show up for this person. I can't always be in this sort of traumatized role or whatever the 
the one who needs fixing. Yeah. I mean, I have to say when I had, yeah, I have, when I had kids, that was such a powerful thing because like, you know, there was something to get up for and not to be in my own head, you know, taking care of them was, it was just, it, it, it put, turned on another light bulb in my brain. And I know that could have gone one or two ways for some people that people traumatized people are often scared of, will they be able to handle the responsibility of children? But it, it actually, I wanted to feel empowered. And so when you were going through something, it, it, it gave my brain a job, you know, not, not to save you, but to hold space for you. I mean, that's why I love my work. When I became a therapist, one of the most beautiful things was that I could see that other people were suffering, that suffering was so human that everyone had a story and that was so healing for me. Um, and it was also, you know, being with a client is such um, intense focus and presence that it was a form of meditation for my brain. You know, so it empowered me to be present, to be out of my own shit for once. I remember I could be in the darkest space, show up for a client and be completely present and it would change everything for me. So you as um, my partner, when you needed help or you set a boundary or you, you know, you were going through something, it was just a reminder that, I have access to other things inside me and that was helpful. I don't want to be a victim of this. You know, I have accepted that it's a part of my life, but I don't want it to be the only identity. I want it to just be a part of it. And I'm hopefully someday I can let go of it fully. Right. And so this might be a good transition into what each person can do, because I'd like to give people like some, some like really concrete ideas about what they can do if they find themselves in a relationship where one or both of you, and I think we need to speak to that too, if both people are traumatized, um, but what we can do and um, yeah, so let's, let's transition into, into what it is that we, we as individuals can do. We'll start with, with, with you, what you can do with the person in the traumatized role uh, can do for themselves. And one of the first notes I have is do your friggin' work. Yeah, you have to, you have to get in therapy, find a good therapist, make sure you're not being re-traumatized by your therapist. Um, like I was my first <laughs> one, um, therapy should be a loving, safe space, a place where your therapist mirrors your goodness that sees you, that is your advocate that cheers you on when things go well and mirrors back how horrible, horrible things were that happened to you. Um, but also models your strength. Um, I made time for myself every morning. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I wanted to drill down on that point because we're skipping over that that therapy session where I said, "You've got to be kidding." That's what you're going to tell her. I said that to her <laughs> therapist <laughs> right. because because some therapy. This is the earmark of how you know it's a bad trauma therapist. And all all the good feelings they could possibly have, they just don't want you to necessarily have the experience that you had, and so they'll say things like. Maybe your parents did the best that they could. And that's what this therapist said to her. And she happened to bring me into a session. I don't know why we were so forward thinking at that point, but you were. And you had invited me to the session. I looked, at, I looked at the therapist and I said, that's what you're going to tell her. That. And as we left, I said, I know I shouldn't tell you this, but you need a different therapist. And I think, yeah. and by and large, she probably had your, she really did care for you in her way. I don't think she had malintent. I just don't think she was particularly good at dealing with, the level of trauma that you had. And I think she just wanted to kind of find a way for you to not feel how you're currently feeling, which is the goddamn worst fucking thing you could ever do to someone who's feeling the way you're feeling. And yeah. So she just invalidated a, me. <laughs> she just invalidated. It. Yeah. We say invalidated, yeah. but that's what invalidation does, right? Like it tells you, it, it doubles down on what was already done to you. It's a gaslighting essentially of, yeah. Oh, here's another place where someone's telling me that I shouldn't feel how I already fucking feel. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, therapy, I now have two therapists. Um, <laughs> two years ago, I got an equine assisted therapist. So I have a therapist that works with horses and then I have my therapist that I've been working with for gosh, like 16, 17 years, who is amazing. Um, I get up every morning. I spend time outside. I have to be in nature as much as possible that, um, for those of you with trauma, it's good to know that nature, um, the earth produces alpha waves, which are the state of relaxation, meditation, um, intuitive states. I actually have an alpha stem, stem machine, which I put on my ears and it sends alpha waves to my brain, um, fear and triggered response or beta waves. So I found myself seeking nature all the time. And when I read this, I understood I was seeking those alpha waves. So, I mean, if it's raining, you'll see me in a raincoat sitting outside begging Larry to build me a pavilion so I can sit outside in the mornings. But, um, you know, I have to 
my mental health is my priority. It's the things I do. I spend time with horses. I surf. That helps keep me courageous. It helps. Yeah. Me don't forget the surfing. Rem remember that I am not um, just fear that I am strong and I'm courageous and I can be in the ocean. I need to challenge those narratives that um, tell me that I'm a victim or what happened to me. I need to challenge them on a daily basis. I need to connect with people. I need to connect with my family. I need to connect with myself. Um, because those are all those good feelings that I didn't get growing up. And so I create them for myself on a daily basis. Yeah. And my you know, work like is watch, so connected. Right. And I watch you deal with huge animals when you're standing in the paddocks with them. It's like, whoa, that's a, you know, that's, there's something about that. Like, and I've watched you charge huge waves and, you know, paddle in and out of things that I'm like, God damn it. Um, that's, that's a lot. And, and so I, there's something about, is there, is there an integrative piece in those experiences for you where you, can you talk about that? Like what happens for you, like body, mind, soul, when, when you're dealing with big waves and big animals? Oh, I, I think what I've learned is, um, we need those experiences because they do integrate new narratives that we are strong. We are courageous. We're not just a victim mm -hmm. that we can face mm -hmm. things and, mm -hmm. and um, enjoy them. Also surfing. I love because the, the joy outweighs the risk. What I realized is when I was doing things like having going to social events or hanging out with people and I would wake up the next day and feel shame. Um, mm -hmm. I used to not address the shame or confront the shame. So every time I did that, I reinforced that connecting with people made me feel ashamed. And therefore I was bad. So I really became resistant to social connection on many levels, unless I, they were very safe people because I was constantly reinforcing that humans meant shame. Now what I've done, especially over the past year or two is been really connected to people on a level and, you know, making sure I acknowledge what feels good. What are big successes for me? Um, you know, always with my work with clients, connecting with people that not all humans are unsafe. And so that's the integrative piece. Every time we don't pay attention to those negative feelings that trauma creates and we just give into them, I think we reinforce the narrative. We reinforce the trauma we're supposed to feel that way. So when you talk about being with horses, I can be with big animals and connect with them and I'm safe. I can go out into the ocean and I'm safe and I'm courageous and I'm having fun. That's a whole new experience of life. Yes, it, it yeah. changed everything. And it's so, you know, what I heard in there is do your work, uh, do more than therapy. You do, you know, read, journal, exercise. Uh, you talked about the integrative piece of, of I can do that. And and what I we've talked about this before, but I, I want to touch on this is that, that victim saturated narrative yeah. that can very quickly uh, present itself is that I am traumatized. I am a PTSD mm -hmm sufferer. Um, and I know that in your work with yourself and with your clients, and I do the same with mine that, you know, we really push the notion that, well, we want to validate and kind of go through and peruse those, those experiences and those feelings and, and all of that, you are not a broken person. And we also have to know that we also have to, to, to reauthor that. And I think that's probably true. Like what, what happens with the surfing and the horses is you are, essentially reauthoring a new narrative around yourself as a person. Every person. time, every time. Mm -hmm. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, you laugh at me. You're like, you don't miss a day. I don't because that just makes me feel like I'm a completely different person. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in all this, and this is, this is, I don't want to steal your, your line, but this is something you've, you've talked about that I think is um, pretty profound. You said you have to have a relationship to your trauma. Yes. And that's you, how I have, have a relationship to trauma. You have to have a relationship to it. Tell me more about that. I, um, Maybe you already did. <laughs> I can't deny that it's a part of my life. Um, mm -hmm. And I also don't have to make it everything. I need to make sure that I have to be one step ahead of it. And that means every day I show up for myself in a way and I'll feel it. You know, if I can't do the things, I'll start to feel not like I used to, but a little agitated, a little closed in, a little claustro claustrophobic, um, but nothing like I used to. I don't wake up and feel shame like I used to. Um, but part of that relationship to my trauma is like, I can't lay in bed and ruminate, let my mind take over, things like that. I have to keep myself healthy. Just like a chronically ill person has to eat right, has to exercise, take the right supplements. I have to do everything I can. And I have to eat right and take supplements to be one step ahead of this. And um, like I said, I do want to reiterate that it's so much better than it was. 
Like I can feel joy, my capacity for love is so much greater, my capacity for connection, my self-confidence. I actually can be seen I'm doing a podcast. I've done several <laughs> this year. That's a miracle compared Let's to- Let's talk about the reels, the reels you're doing. <laughs> Trying, <laughs> I, yes. I couldn't even see myself on film or camera because mm -hmm. I felt monstrous. And yeah. the fact that I can look at so myself crazy. now is a miracle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but it's, it's true. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been remarkable. Like I've seen you doing things like it, no one else would notice because I hear people going, Oh my God, I saw that reel. That was so cool. And I'm like, you have no idea what it took you to get there. <laughs> no. So I have a question for you. So good. Oh boy. As the non traumatized partner, just for this session that we're talking about, mm -hmm. has it been worth it? <laughs> has it been worth it i've yes. and, I, and i told you before that 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 sweet hiney of yours makes it all worth it. Um, it, it actually does it's so good i love it so much um no it it of course it's been worth it it's i think it's taken you know look i uh, i often say that some of the things that i hold and cherish closest to my heart are things i wouldn't wish on my worst enemy um and I'm not saying, I'm just saying this, this is not for the faint of heart, but I do think that it's taken us to a depth with one another that probably, I'm, I mean, I don't know, maybe wouldn't have happened had we not had this, right? It forced yeah. us to, I mean, I think it either would force calamity and in, in us to not be together or it forced us closer together. And I think for us, it forced us closer together and it made us yeah, go deeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had to have deep conversations. I mean, difficult conversations very early on. Um, yeah, and I had that to relationship. Get, I had to get my head out of my ass and stop saying things like "use your tools." You didn't do that very often. You were amazing. <laughs> no, you were amazing. Still, yeah, but I, I often think that you you went through a lot. Yeah, you mm -hmm. went through a lot. Well, and so let's let's dovetail that into what the quote unquote non traumatized partner can do. Um, and some tips and, uh, pieces we can offer to them. And one of the first ones that really became important for me was to try and understand the trauma and trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, I think very often, especially in our culture, we like to bypass feelings. We, we pathologize feelings like sadness and, you know, we, what we don't understand, we sort of like, well, you know, can't you just be happy? Um, for my clients who experience trauma, their partners often are, you know, kind of flummoxed at how they could be so upset, so sad, so wounded, so hurt by this. Isn't it in the past? Um, do we have to be defined by our past and, and all of those comments? And what really helped me shy away from those very fixy um, aspects was to really begin to understand what it was you're going through and to understand that just because you can't see the wound doesn't mean it's not there. Right. Um, and, um, once I got a, I mean, all it takes is a quick Google search for crying out loud. I mean, let's not be lazy about it, right? If you love somebody, you'll at least read an article, read one or two articles on PTSD and trauma. And you're going to be like, holy shit, yeah. um, this is real. And if, if you, if you can't look at your partner and see that those tears and, um, those feelings are actually, re those reactions are actually real. Um, then, then I, I, I don't know what to do other than say, you know, read a book, uh, go on YouTube. There's plenty of, of stuff. There's plenty of information right there. So really understanding trauma and, and the trauma, the specific trauma that your partner's going through. Um, operating from a place of compassion. Um, you know, because once you understand something, you can really learn to operate from a place of compassion. You know, understanding your trauma. And I, I said this to you earlier today. I said, you know, we watch The Godfather 2, or we actually watch The Godfather the other night and there's a scene in there where Talia Shire gets beaten with a belt and early in our relationship I had a hard time understanding why you were like I can't I can't when you started to come in real contact with your with with what happened to you, you you're like I can't watch violence on TV anymore I have a hard time with violent movies and violent games and all that shit and I was like really I mean it's just a movie that's that's how you if you're not, if you've never experienced it, it's a movie to no one who's experienced it, but to me, that's exactly right. It's a lived reality. Yeah. That's well said a lived reality. 
And for me, I was like, you know, it's just the movie. We're sitting here. I'm here. I got my big old arms around you. You're safe as a kitten. And what I didn't realize is this pinging that shit in you and mm -hmm. triggering you. And so that's mm -hmm. when the other night when um, that scene came on, you didn't even know it, but I fast forward through it. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have yeah, to see I'm it. I'm so grateful. And I'm so grateful. That's the kind of, you know, operating from compassion, from empathy, from understanding that can it's help such a loving your act relationship to keep an eye out for those things. Yeah. It's awareness. Yeah. Not just that, whatever, whatever that is for you and your relationship to, to be able to sort of attune to your partner and what it is that they've been through and sort of see the, 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 the lay of the land in front and sort of say, you know, I don't, I don't want them to have to experience that again. Yeah. Um, and, uh, what else? You have to know that your shit counts as the yep. non-traumatized partner, um, that you get to talk about your stuff too. We touched on that a little bit earlier in the segment and mm -hmm. to be able to bring your stuff to your partner, uh, is actually really, really good, um, uh, for them too, um, yeah. to recognize that, that very often love is inconvenient and, um, it's going to be, uh, it can be difficult uh, to deal with uh, people who are feeling the depths of, the, of, of what it is that they're feeling, but that you also have to pr practice really good boundaries and know what you're capable of um, yeah. and be able to have like a conversation. Like you and I have sort of established this understanding that it's okay for me to tap out from time to time and say, primarily because of the work we do, but like, I just, I don't have room in this for me right now. Can we talk about this a little later or after I have a cup of coffee or after we sit down and just kind of breathe. Um, yeah. And I think that's just healthy that? relationshiping, re relationshiping <laughs> to be able to say that. Relationshiping. Yeah. Relationship. I like that. Yeah. It's good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I also like to say, you know, it seems sort of evident, but I had to come to the understanding that I was not going to be able to fix you. Mm -hmm. Right that there wasn't some nugget of profundity that I was going to offer. There wasn't some thing I was going to, uh, say, and suddenly this would just go away. Um, that truly my presence and my willingness to be with you through this and to hear you and to listen and to validate your experience. That was all, that's all I was really required to do. Um, yeah. And I think you know, that was, that was the piece that was hard for me because I think it's, and I'm painting with gender strokes here, but men in particular feel like we've got, we've got our tool belts on. We're going to try and fix it. And to know that I couldn't fix you, that was hard. I felt like I was sitting on my hands a lot, but then when I gave it a little room, a little lead to kind of like, just do less and just listen more and create and hold space and knowing that I don't have to fix you. When I started giving that op an opportunity to sort of take root, I, I started noticing that like would actually come around faster. We wouldn't get in fights because you're not listening to what I'm saying, Ash, this could really help you. Right. Um, <laughs> then we got in a few of those. Yeah. And yeah. so we didn't have to deal with any of that because I wasn't offering my wisdom. Um, but no, I, we, we I, learned I, I that saying less is always best. <laughs> <laughs> At least for me. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. <laughs> saying less is always best. Yeah, that's true. No, but I've, Recently, I've done this recently where, you know, you've told me before, you're like, look, if I don't have one good cry every day, it's not been a good day. And that really landed on, I was like, okay. So that really normalized your tears. And so periodically I would find her, you know, having a little cry somewhere, usually up in our room, laying on the bed, um, just have it taken a moment. And normally that would sort of exacerbate me in or years past, or, or I would sort of be like, oh, fuck, you know, I got to do something. And what I stopped, I stopped doing is trying to fix it, stop trying to speak to it. And so sometimes I would just come in, lay down next to you and wrap my arms around you. Wouldn't say anything. Yeah. We just hold you for a little while. And then I'd get up and leave and not say a goddamn word. And then later yeah. on that afternoon, I shit you not, like clockwork, you'd come to me and be like, by the way, you were amazing today. And I'm like, I didn't do shit. <laughs> I didn't do anything. But you were like, you were so no, you don't have to do anything. Right. Just presence, presence. And I do want to qualify the crying. Um, when I cry, it means my heart is open. So 
you know, I'm processing a lot of client stuff as a medium. I connect to the other side for other people. If I don't integrate or let go of the grief that I've come in contact mm -hmm. with, then it shuts me down. Um, so mm -hmm. sometimes I cry for myself and sometimes I'm crying for my clients. I'm just crying for the world because there's a lot of dark shit out there. Um, <laughs> but I so appreciate that it's, <laughs> as my kids say, mom's processing. Um, <laughs> mom's in process, but it is processing because that's how I feel my heart. Because I remember there were years where I couldn't feel my heart. And so I just feel like it's a gift. And then when I'm in it with myself and you just come in and wrap your arms around me, it also affirms that, you know, I'm going to be okay. It affirms mm -hmm. that, you know, you don't need to do anything that you can just be present with it and it's okay. So, well, and for me, that's yeah, so thank you. it's, it's, it's so great to kind of take that pressure off myself that I have to do something. Um, and anyway, I think it's probably time to kind of wrap it up. Uh, I know we're probably getting towards time. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking, I think so, we covered everything. I mean, the non-traumatized person. I think we did. I think we covered everything and, and I can, I'm starting to hear the, uh, the, the, uh, lawn guys outside. So we're going to have to yep. we're gonna ruin our audio if we're not careful. Uh, this is Lair Torrent, the holistic therapist on Instagram. I have a book called The Practice of Love. And all of the practices that are in there not only can help you in your relationship, but if you're having a relationship with a partner who is in trauma or that's a piece for you, I, I think you would agree, Ash, because frankly, you helped me write the book, um, that all of these aspects would be are really, really useful for anyone in a relationship, and, and, but certainly and even uh, not a in a relationship. Not in a relationship. Well, that's, we've heard that too. A lot of people have talked about yeah. that too. Singles, I think it's great to get to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And the book's really about showing up in your best version of yourself to your life and whomever and whatever you're relating to. And you can find that wherever yeah. finer books are sold. So if you don't have anything else, I'm Lara Torrent, the holistic therapist, and you are? Ashley Torrent, intuitive medium and psycho spiritual therapist. Thank you all so much for listening. You you can find us both on Instagram and we hope to hear from you soon. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere and come back, if you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you could just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, Zoom links to private gathers. So if you want to join our community, go to singleonpurpose.life. Thank you for listening. Be well. We hope you tell a friend. Hi, my name is Kay, and this is my single on purpose kind of singlehood journey. Uh, earlier this year, about the third week of January, my then at the time boyfriend came in one Sunday after two weeks of turbulence and looked at me and said, I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. And that is when my whole world kind of came crashing down. We both talked about it a lot, decided to get into therapy individually. Him for his issues that apparently were not related to the relationship and me for my issues, which was very much related for the issues. My therapy talk all around my phone actually let the Facebook algorithm show me the angry therapist. And it kind of started my journey of I needed to figure out where I was because through the month and a half of still living with my then ex and trying to find a place to live, I realized I had a lot of codependency issues, control issues. I got to learn about attachment styles. And that was kind of thanks to the little Facebook videos of the angry therapist. And I listened to one of your podcast with Vanessa and you guys had like a small disagreement on the podcast and you talked your way through it and I found it so amazingly fascinating that I wanted to be able to do that too 
and not have my emotions get dredged up and everything. And through talking with my therapist and still at that time talking with my ex because I was misguidedly trying to be friends, um, I realized that we both had a, a terrible relationship. Well, not terrible, but a surface level relationship. And I discovered attachment styles and how I tend to lean way, way, way anxious. And he was extremely avoidant. And after some disrespect in the friendship, I ended talking with him. And a few months later of going through more therapy and trying to learn some more stuff and actually buying your single on purpose book because I wanted to get better at it. I learned some more facts about our relationship that he cheated and stuff like that. And I leaned heavily on watching and listening to all your podcasts and going hard into therapy until one day I got to one of your podcasts where you asked about what you want to do with your life and your passions. And I decided I wanted to look into going to be a therapist. So if you've got any advice on what schools you would suggest... I'd highly appreciate that, um, but I've discovered that through listening and reading your books, I had completely lost myself for a very long time. Five, five years I'd lost myself, and all I did was be codependent and completely dependent on him and never always pursuing his dreams and pushing to his dreams because I totally date potential. I didn't even realize that I had any dreams that I wanted to do. So now I'm looking at leaving my art related career to go into therapy. And it's something that I'm terrified to do. But because of listening to everything and leaning hard into stuff that I'm scared of, because it leads to either a really great lesson or an awesome adventure, or both, I've really started to embrace being single for the first time in a long time. And it's amazing that something that was so earth shattering now has turned into probably one of the best things in my life, even though it's very hard on a lot of days. But I'm just really excited to continue being single and hopefully find a cool person to enjoy the journey with eventually. <laughs>